Hi, my name's Tim Escott. Let's look at God's Word together. So have your Bible open in front of you and we can do that together. So let's pray as we come to do so. Our Father, we thank you that you've spoken to us and most supremely through your Son, Jesus. We pray now that as we come to listen to you, that you will show up for us that by your spirit you would enable us to hear your promises and trust and respond to you in faith and obedience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. My wife Naomi celebrated her birthday last week and we celebrated with a family Wizard of Oz party because, you know, at the moment there's no place like home. So we dressed up and we all watched the movie together. Now when the tornado comes at the start of the movie, there's panic and terror. And Dorothy ends up back in a room where she's knocked unconscious. But then she, she wakes up and it's not over because she's inside the storm. And she sees the world kind of floating around her, taking on these strange forms. And for these moments in the movie, she's in a sort of limbo, an in-between that could go in any direction. And Dorothy knows that the ground is far beneath her, but she has no idea where she's going or how she's going to get there. And there's something about the times that we're in that feels so in between. Like the time that we're living in now is a kind of limbo. And we can look back to our normal lives of a couple of months ago. We can even look back to when things were really kind of ramping up and things were, were kind of a bit crazy and, and unsettled and scary. But now it's a bit like we're kind of in the eye of the storm. You know, things have calmed a bit, but we still have no idea where things are headed. And, you know, I think other parts of our lives can be like this too. You know, when a relationship breaks down and, and the future looks so uncertain, or when we do something foolish or careless or wrong, and the consequences be are beginning to unfold before us, but how things are going to go is still unclear. Or when we're in a new situation that's completely new, and unknown. And at these times, we can be so aware of our own faults, of our own shortcomings, and feel disconnected, disconnected from others, disconnected from God's plans and His promises. Now, in today's story, in one night in Jacob's life, Jacob finds himself in a situation like that, in an in-between place, carrying the consequences of his actions of the past and unsure about the future, and disconnected and cut off from his family and from his God. Now, last week we saw how Jacob, being true to his name, was born grabbing at his twin brother's heel. Later in life, he took advantage of his brother and cheated him out of his firstborn privileges. And then he took advantage of his elderly father, deceiving him and stealing his older brother's blessing. So his brother wants to kill him, and so he runs away to his grandfather's homeland in Haran to find a wife. And this is hundreds of kilometers to the north of his home in Beersheba. And so we find Jacob estranged from his father and a fugitive from his twin brother. He has no idea if his plan to escape his brother and find a wife will work. He's leaving the land of promise behind him, to go into exile in a far-off land. And when night comes, he doesn't have the wherewithal to find somewhere to stay, so he sleeps out in the open, in an unknown, in-between place, inexperienced, alone and vulnerable in the dark night. And it's at this moment, as he quietly dreams, that the Lord God graciously shows up he looks and he sees a ladder or a stairway to heaven and he sees angels of God going up and down. This is a gateway between the heavens and the earth, a portal between the divine and human realms. Where humans had tried to build the great tower of Babel, the stairway to heaven, to proudly get themselves up into the heavens, they failed. But now... Jacob sees that God had been making that connection all along. And the Lord is there. And he says to him, 
I am the Lord. Now, this all might sound primitive and strange. You know, he has a rock for a pillow. He sees things in a dream, the staircase to heaven. But the point here isn't really about how God shows up. The point is that he shows up to this unexpected man at such an unexpected time in an unexpected place. Jacob is unpleasant and greedy. He is wearing the consequences of his actions and seemingly far from God's promises and purposes. But this God takes the initiative and graciously shows himself to whomever he chooses, whenever and however he chooses. God doesn't just show himself to the people we expect him to, to the spiritual, to the law-abiding, to the good-hearted. Because of his grace, God shows himself to whomever he chooses, whether you are spiritual or unspiritual, law-abiding or beyond redemption, kind or mean-spirited. And we heard in the reading from John chapter 1 that Jesus Christ speaks about himself as this staircase, the one on whom the angels of God move up and down as the portal between divine and human realms. Through Jesus, God graciously shows up to people who don't deserve it, to you and me. Now, it might be that in your disoriented, in-between times, God has been showing up to you, calling you to follow Jesus. And when you've felt unsure and inexperienced, uncertain, ashamed and disconnected from God and from others, and even in those times when you feel least worthy or least able to answer his call, he can show up and say, I am the Lord. The question is, will you open your eyes to his gracious call? But God doesn't just show up to Jacob. Despite Jacob's grasping, God instead makes Jacob some big promises. Now, three of the promises he's already promised to Abraham and Isaac before him a land to live in, a big family of descendants, and blessing that would radiate out to the rest of the world. Now, these three promises are central to the story of Genesis. And they're some of the central gospel promises in the Bible because they're about God reversing the curse that covers over the creation and over humankind. But the promises for Jacob continue, and and these are distinctive for Jacob. They're new and they're fresh. And in verse 15... God says, Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. As God appears to Jacob, he promises to be with him even in his exile, in this distant place and dark night, to protect him to safely bring him home and to never forsake him. Because of his love, God has chosen Jacob and so he will never forsake him. Jacob was the father of God's people Israel and as part of God's people through Jesus, for us, these promises extend to us as well. Our Lord Jesus is called Emmanuel, God with us. And by his spirit in us, He is always with us. He keeps us as his and he will bring us home to be with him. No matter what we go through, no matter what sin we struggle against or the uncertainty that we feel as we live in between things. Because when God chooses us, he will never abandon us. In our moments of deepest crisis, God is still with us and will eventually fulfill his promises If we trust him, if you trust Jesus, he is with you and he will never forsake you. After he hears all this, how do you think Jacob responds? And how would you respond? He responds how you might expect Jacob to respond. 
in a bit of a strangely mixed way. You know, on, the run, on the one hand, he's on the right track. You know, in verse 16, he, he acknowledges, he says, Surely the Lord is in this place. And it says there that he was afraid. And how awesome is this place, he says. And then he worships God in the way that he knows best by setting up a religious shrine with the rock that he was sleeping on. And he makes a vow that he will have God as his God and he will give him a tenth of everything that he has. Now this is a glimpse of a new orientation for Jacob. The possibility of a new life, of accepting God's gifts with humility instead of grasping after them with pride and greed. And in that sense, Jacob is a model for us. God graciously shows up to us, and even though we don't deserve it, he promises to restore us, to be with us. And so what else can we do except to respond to him with awe, loyalty, and worship? But on the other hand, Jacob's response is unfamiliar and inexperienced. He doesn't realize that the Lord was there. He improvises his worship with a rock that he slept on. And unlike God's unconditional promises to him, Jacob's vow is so conditional. If you do all of, the, all of those things, God, then I'll follow you. You know, I think that Jacob's response here is revealing because it mirrors the way our response to God's grace can be so ambivalent and unfamiliar. God freely gives us so much, but our response to him can seem so feeble. You know, our half-hearted confession, our uncertain prayers, our mixed attempts to live his way. But even in our flailing attempts to respond to his grace, God's promises endure. His unconditional grace means that even our most inexperienced and subdued responses won't push God away. Jacob did begin to be, learn to be more humble and faithful to his God, and we'll learn from him about that in coming weeks. But for now, he shows us that our mixed attitudes to God are not a barrier to God's saving grace. If you, if you look back over Abraham's story, Jacob's uh, grandfather. His story is a model of faith. But if, Jacob's, if Abraham's story is a model of faith, then Jacob's story is a model of God's grace. This man who sought to wrangle God's blessings through deceit and ends up in a strange, dark and uncertain place, God yet graciously shows up and makes incredible promises even to him. So as we find ourselves in strange, dark and uncertain places and times, whether from forces inside us, our own doing, or things outside us, God gives himself to us in our Lord Jesus, chooses us, calls us, shows up and promises never to abandon us. Praise be to God for his wonderful grace.